We have a few more minutes. Uh, we'll start officially at the, at the start time, which is in about three minutes' time. So uh, have a quick conversation, and then we'll, we'll uh, make sure that the room fully fills before we start so that nobody can miss anything. Okay, well, I see that effectively all of the seats in the audience are taken already. It's wonderful to see so much interest uh, in today's session. Um, hello, my name is Fiona Skinner. I coordinate the Industrial Deep Decarbonization Initiative on behalf of the UN Industrial Development Organization. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be your moderator today um, for a discussion on decarbonizing building materials. We have a very, very knowledgeable group of experts across uh, government, private sector, trade associations, uh, and international initiatives here with us today to discuss this topic. Um, and it's clear that we cannot decarbonize, uh, that we can't meet the goals of the Paris Agreement uh, without decarbonizing building materials. Uh, the production and use of building materials represents roughly 37% of global GHG emissions. Um, and we've heard many different statistics trying to make this this problem a little bit more tangible. Uh, the one I like to use is that the world is expected to build the equivalent of a New York City every month for the next 40 years. So uh, the significance of building materials in the decarbonization equation is really only set to increase in the coming decades. And we are in Paris today, uh, and we know that the challenges, the solutions, and the opportunities uh, that exist for France are not the same as those that exist for uh, China, for India, India, or for Kenya. And uh, we can't overlook the local context. Uh, we know that no one solution fits all. Uh, so to begin, I'd really like to invite our introductory speaker to the podium, uh, the Honorable Alice Wahome, who is the Cabinet Secretary in charge of the Kenyan Ministry for lands, public works, housing, and urban development. She will be giving a keynote speech on the scale of construction uh, and public works expected in Kenya over the coming decades and what Kenya is doing to decarbonize building materials. Please. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, as you can see, I have a new hairstyle. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Fiona, for this uh, particular um, opportunity. I'm very pleased uh, my delegation is here with me. Maybe they could just start quickly. Yes, uh, the principal secretary is here with his team, and uh, they have helped me to come up with a few speaking notes so that uh, we can uh, start this particular session. I'm delighted to be among the participants. Thank you very much. May I, at the beginning, take the opportunity to thank the organizers, the Government of France, United Nations and Environment Program, Global Alliance for Building and Construction, and the organizers, organizations that have participated 
and made sure that the building and construction has come from all, you know, sector has come from all corners of the world to address buildings and climate. I think this is among the really very key topics that uh, possibly have been left behind. But we are here, and I'm sure we'll make very sound uh, resolutions together. Kenya, like other African countries, is urbanizing an unprecedented pace and scale, and with over 70% of building stock required by 2050 yet to be built, UN Habitat, you know, is, housed, is hosted by Kenya. We are very proud to do that. And in these countries, there is a bigger role and there is a better opportunity for all of us. Addressing challenges arising from the building sector in the global south and multi, the global south in Africa requires a comprehensive, multi-sectoral, multilateral strategy. Countries are encouraged to strengthen their collaboration and partnership fabric moving forward as demonstrated here today. M more infrastructure investments are expected as the governments and private sector race to accommodate the emerging populations, particularly in our urban areas. As a continent, there is need to partner and cooperate with, uh, to maximize on the socioeconomic benefits and the value chain, by, and, and therefore creating a situation of leaving no one behind, build capacities of the built environment institutions, and enhance public awareness on decarbonized materials, green solutions, investment in, in, in science and technology, while empowering and supporting uh, local value chains, especially in building the skills sets for women and youth in the sector. Kenya remains committed at national and global levels to attainment of its climate commitments under its updated NDC, NDC contributions or NDC position, more so with related to climate mitigation, adaptation, and the resilience of a low carbon development footprint. Counties in our government setup are as devolved units of governance provide an accelerated opportunities for building sector in its endeavor to accommodate new developed structures. We anticipate public buildings, constructions activities, for instance, in the affordable housing program currently being implemented by one of my state departments. Today I'm here under the Public Works State Department, but I also have Housing and Urban Development uh, Department. We have a huge program that, is, uh, that proposes or endeavors to do 200,000 units per year, and then maybe the rest be left to the private sector. And to effectively deliver various government priority programs, decarbonization of building materials uh, is, is key. I beg your pardon, is key. And the roadmap is, is key to our, build, developing a roadmap for that is key for our achievement for Kenya Vision 2030. And we are not very far from 2030. The roadmap details how the buildings and the industrialization sector will contribute to the attainment of net zero by 2050 while growing the economy and taking advantage of green growth opportunities. <coughs> Onboarding Kenya's building and construction sector in these global actions co complements our national efforts achieved so far. Number one, we have uh, the hosting of the Africa Climate Summit in September 2023, prepared and propelled the buildings and construction sector in Kenya into higher levels of its accelerated growth Indeed, we, we, we continue to engage in that. Kenya remains available to support Pan-African efforts and another, in other areas, in areas of decarbonizing building construction materials, leading to realization of the African leaders and Nairobi Declaration on transforming the continent in a climate positive manner. The joining of building breakthrough, I hope some of you seated here were in Nairobi in September last year. The joining of building breakthrough initiatives by Kenya 
indicates our commitment to, among others, create and strengthen our sustainable built environment commitments for near zero and resilient buildings, as well as supporting decarbonization, uh, decarbonization of building materials used in public and private sector levels. Uh, the joining cement breakthrough indicates that Kenya's preparedness to transition its key infrastructure development projects to green economy grid. I urge other global south countries to consider it fit to join in this initiative as well to support their government's uh, work. Adoption and uh, support of doubling down on energy efficiency and tripling renewable energy and joining global pledges will go a long way supporting the decarb decarbonization of building materials agenda for Kenya and other countries. We are also looking at domestication and implementation of these commitments as an ongoing uh, drive and ambition to meet our African manifesto for sustainable cities and built environment with the development of technology for 3D home printing, the first net zero building with over 60% TBA mapping of where our building stock with the use of artificial intelligence and set right for smart planning and further focusing on green manufacturing and industrialization activities. I know I'm, I'm rushing because our time is very short. May I say in action and priority areas, Kenya's baseline approach is to encourage and invite more partners, the international community, and investors to harness opportunities arising from the local and international construction. Indeed, the 200,000 units per year is still a drop in the ocean for us in Kenya because we have a shortage of at least 2 million housing units that we intend to catch up with as every year we require 200,000 units. Of course, that then means if we do not observe uh, the greening and climate uh, action uh, uh, policies, then we will commit, maybe we will have uh, a cement, uh, uh, what do we call them, blocks and blocks without uh, looking at the investment in, in greening. In, we will also invite uh, investors and assure them that their investment with our government and our local communities is safe. We have created very good environment, tax exemptions for this work. We have registrative framework to support our development work. Indeed, we recently amended our climate, uh, uh, our climate uh, act, uh, act to include carbonization issues, and we are now at a very good place in terms of registrative framework. We are also looking at offtake guarantees in housing development so that uh, we, we have room and space for partnering. At the moment, I think the country is experiencing the best political goodwill at the highest level because our president is a global champion for climate uh, change action. And therefore, I'm looking forward to partnering with all of you here. I'm also looking forward to a very engaged uh, discussion or conversation that will make an impact and the right resolutions in this particular sector. As the Minister Cabinet Secretary for LADS, Public Works, Housing and Urban Development, uh, we are moving a new building code and uh, I just signed it while I was here so that it can move to parliament. And we have considered building materials that take care of the discussion going here for low carbonization of building materials. And I'm very glad that uh, that is moving that way while I'm here, right here in France in this conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Wahoma, and thank you for illustrating how the decarbonization of building materials and green growth really goes hand in hand. Um, so next up, I'd like to invite Chris Carroll, Building Engineering Director at Arup, 
who will be giving a short scene setting presentation to zoom out and give us the global perspective on the need to decarbonize building materials. Please, Chris. Which one do I click? The green one. Uh, right, so that's me. I, I'm, um, I'm an engineer and a designer. So this is very much a, a perspective from um, the world of design. Um, and for me, I'm, I'm, um, my, my primary objective is actually the, um, the carbon in the buildings that we create, not the carbon in the materials. And I'm agnostic to the materials that I use. I just want the best outcome. I want the lowest carbon building from the, from the designs that I work on all over the world um, in, in whatever sector that I'm working on. Um, as, a, as a backdrop, um, from, from a global perspective, we're building somewhere in the region of five billion square meters of, of new building every year. So a city the size of Paris every week. Um, and that represents about four gigatons of carbon, um, which is about 10% of global emissions. And the, the mission to be aligned with Paris is to half that by 2030. So as we saw earlier today, in terms of the global um, uh, summary report from Global ABC, uh, we're, we're not making that. So we, we have to pick up the pace, we have to do things more radically, we have to be more systemic. And in, in the backdrop to that, the materials that we're using to, to um, and extracting to, to build that real estate are, are predominantly materials like steel and concrete. And the idea that we're going to pivot away from that in the space of seven years or a decade, we're, we're just not going to do that. So we have to tackle those head on. We, this brief pause, I know this is about carbon, but um, we, we shouldn't forget <coughs> nature, actually. And we've just done a piece of work with the WBCSD, which is on their website, <coughs> pointing to the fact for the, for the built environment, the, the, the biggest... Um, nature impact is embodied in the materials that we produce and specify. So alongside embodied carbon, we should also be considering embodied nature. And those, those two things should go hand in hand in terms of our consideration because we shouldn't do one to the detriment of the other. On the first graph, we saw um, materials like timber are, are actually um, a, a relatively... Um, precious commodity when you look at them on a global perspective. So we have to be using them to their best um, ends in terms of the buildings that we, we create. And this is, a, this is an extract from a graph that I've taken from a piece of work done by the Institution of Structural Engineers where they looked at um, different types of timber use. And ac actually the conclusion um, is, is that timber <coughs> used well from, from uh, sustainably sourced um, uh, and especially if we consider the end of life use of the timber is really, really good, is, 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 is one of the better outcomes that we can have in terms of building construction. But timber used badly, and I, I've seen lots of cases where timber is either proposed or used badly, can be worse than using steel and concrete. So we shouldn't just make an automatic assumption that timber is good and steel and concrete is bad. It's about how we use those materials, and it's about you know, the, the detail of how we, how we put things together. And, it, and it's about resource use as well. We, we, we have to do more, if we're gonna hit a reduction of halving things, which we're not on track for, within the next decade, we're going to have to do more with less, actually. And, the, the, and the, there, is a, there is a tension there, because there's a lot of suppliers in the room here, and you make money out of selling product. But actually, we, we, we want to use a bit less product, actually, and then we want to use better products. So the, the, this example here is, is a flat slab compared to a waffled slab or a rib slab. And they both do exactly the same job, um, but one has a third less material in it. And we can make much better decisions and take low-hanging fruit almost instantly just by thinking more about carbon outcomes compared to, say, convenience or other, other metrics that we've been, we've been using. And another thing we're looking at more and more now is actually moving away from the convention of steel, concrete, but starting to think about hybrid combinations of these materials and the outcomes we can achieve in terms of decarbonisation 
by combining these materials better. So this, the, on the right-hand side, is, a, is a, a slab that we've developed for a project in um, Amsterdam, Hout, which is, which is being constructed, and we're using this um, slab more, uh, more and more now. And it combines these two materials to work structurally kind of together in harmony. And actually the concrete, rather than providing supplementary fire protection acoustic uh, treatment to the timber, the concrete provides that automatically. So we, we're really squeezing the efficiency out of those two materials and the use of those two materials. And w we, we have to look <coughs> at uh, other alternatives. Um, and there are some amazing ideas coming forward in terms of uh, cement replacement using uh, silica pozzolans around rice husk ash, the recent use of rice husk ash, um, using hemp bricks to uh, create block work. But w w with all of these, we, we have to collaborate around the best ideas that are emerging, and we, we have to look at um, you know, creating um, demand and, and uh, demand levers to really, really like hyper-accelerate the, the, the coming forward of these products, and the, the ones that are uh, credible at scale and at pace, because uh, you know, time is of the essence. So we, we have to um, you know, rapidly evolve codes and standards that support these things. We can't, we can't develop these in, 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 in decades anymore. We, you know, years, you know, within a few years is where we, so we need to support that with the development of um, codes and standards that support that. We have to drive it through, th through levers such as public procurement, um, and we really want to drive investment into the, the credible versions of, of these new materials, new approaches. Oops, I did, I did, uh, I almost got away with not double clicking. Um, <laughs> I went to a really good session yesterday um, hosted by the GCCA, Global Cement and Concrete Association. And th th like the steel industry, like lots of parts of industry, they have a really, um, they've developed a really clear pathway in terms of how they see um, cement and concrete um, decarbonizing. And I think we have to all engage with these now. We all have to see where we fit into challenging that and the tension around some of the <coughs> assumptions that are made in terms of these uh, decarbonisation pathways. And for, for me as a designer, I, I, I would question in some geographies whether 22% um, is, um, is, is enough, actually, and whether we could, we could challenge that more. And actually, that, that raises a point here as well, is that although you know, there's a global perspective, most of that construction is not going to happen in the global northwest. It's going to happen kind of elsewhere in the world, global south, um, East Asia, um, so uh, the, the picture is going to be slightly different, kind of everywhere, and we, we, we have to uh, we have to consider the kind of nuances of that as as we as we you know as we develop these pathways. Oops, done it again. And at, at, a, at a kind of big picture scale, I, I really like this unit diagram, which I've slightly tweaked. I hope they don't mind. But um, the, the, it, it, it was a real clear kind of picture for me of what we want to do, which is kind of, you know, reduce our um, use, get better use, avoid waste using kind of conventional materials, develop those conventional materials to be lower carbon. Um, and there's some great work going on in, you know, in all the industries, steel, concrete, around carbon capture, use and storage, et cetera, et cetera. And then we want to push as fast as possible genuine, credible um, bio-based alternatives that can be scaled. So I, I, I would question, in, in, in the context of the global northwest, <laughs> timber is a great construction material, but... At, 5,000 cubic metres of timber, it's not going to solve the world's problems on a, on a global scale. So, I mean, we, 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 we want to be really pushing a whole suite of bio-based um, options here at all kinds of scales and for all types of construction typology. And last slide here. When, when I was a, um, a, um, a young engineer, one of my um, inspirations was Pierluigi Nervi who's an Italian um, engineer designer who worked in post-war Italy 
in an, in an area where resource was not readily available, there was a shortage of, of, of resource. Money was, you know, not, not as, um, was, was, was challenging. And he, uh, Nervi was a designer, an engineer, a contractor, and he, he, he even invented new methods of using ferro-cement and, and, and steel design. He made these amazingly um, uh, efficient, beautiful structures, like the Gatti Wall Factory and others around Italy, um, which, which were really efficient in terms of the materials they used, were really cost efficient, and all of this was being driven by public procurement. So it's almost like you know, a snapshot of what we need to do, whereas we're, we're not one person, we're, we're a whole industry, <coughs> we're a whole value chain. So we, we've got to kind of collaborate to the point where we're like Pierre Luigi Nervi in this context and be driven by the, the, the challenges around us in the same way he was to create these amazingly beautiful um, buildings that are really, really efficient in terms of the resources they use. Thanks so much, Chris. Thanks for that um, optimistic ending, actually. Um, I think the message is clear. There is urgency to action. We need to drive the speed at which we're decarbonizing and innovating. Um, and at the same time, we need to increase demand, whether that's from um, private or public buyers as well. And that's exactly what we're here to speak about today. So really, I'd like to bring up now um, our first panel, and I'll call them up uh, to the stage as I announce them. So first, Karen Scrivener, professor and director of the Laboratory, Laboratory of Construction Materials at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, or EPFL. Um, please take your seat. Then we have Claire Broadbent, who is the Head of Sustainability at World Steel. Eunice Heath, who is the Senior Vice President and Chief Sustainability Officer of CRH. And finally, Pascal Eveillard, who is the Director of Sustainable Business Development at Saint-Gobain. So I'm going to join you here at the table. Um, I'd like to turn to you first, Karen, to build on Chris's scene-setting presentation. I think it connects very well. Uh, I know you spend a lot of your time thinking about um, the future of construction materials, particularly for the Global South. We know that construction materials are set to dominate resource consumption. We've heard it already. Um, and, and particularly um, as growth accelerates across uh, emerging economies and, and developing countries, uh, how can we tackle the emissions that are associated with building materials and develop regionally appropriate solutions? Okay, Fiona, thanks very much for the introduction. Uh, maybe we can go to the... Next slide, because uh, this, whoops, where's it gone? This must be before it, that's it. Yes, so this slide here, I think is really interesting because this shows our consumption of all materials. It's not just construction, but construction is probably three quarters or more of it. And you can see, we're gonna need all these materials, but you can see the overwhelming dominance of concrete um, and you know, we have to then, we then go through to the volumes, which obviously is important in construction, and then the CO2 emissions. So here we see that concrete actually delivers a lot. Um, you know, it has a lot of CO2 emissions overall, but that's because we use so much of it. And this is also a huge opportunity then. It's a huge opportunity to make savings and I mean I'm rebounding a lot on what Chris said he's said a lot of what I want to say but I'll say it again <laughs> that you know we need to use all these opportunities now what I really want to talk about and again I'm very pleased that this was referred to in the opening session and again here is the importance of the global south you know this is going to be 80 percent of construction now in the last three decades China's been the driving force. But now China is really going down. <coughs> we see all companies kind of go through this peak in use of materials, particularly cement, it's very obvious. And China will probably cut by, cut by two thirds its consumption of cement in the next two decades, two, three decades. So we've really got to look where where it's happening next, and this is particularly India and Africa. 
And, you know, in terms of our work on cement, we've been concentrating in these regions. We've developed this LC3 technology. This is not a company, I stress that. It's an open technology available to anybody. Um, and, you know, we've had a lot of success in India, but this is a very well adapted solution to Africa. They're having at present to import a lot of cement, which is, you know, not good for balance of trade and everything. And they have a lot of calcine clays, which is the es essence of LC3. So I think my main message is that it's really important to build partnerships there. Um, I'm very pleased to see uh, the Kenyan delegation. We were there three weeks ago, and we were very fortunate to open a new technical resource center there in Mary University. Um, but, you know, this is really where we, where we need to, you know, there's, there's a lot of energy. I mean, we, I meet a lot of young people, and, you know, this example of a technical resource center, we had a young professor. He was supported by a Swiss government excellent scholarship. He came to work with us for a year, and now he's back in Kenya running this technical resource center. This, for me, is the kind of example of the partnerships we need to, we need to build to um, enable these, to have all this construction we're going to need. And... You know, I'm coming very much from cement and concrete, but we need to now really look across construction. I mean, Chris made the point, you know, we need to optimize everywhere in design, in, you know, the, the materials. Um, we, we need to look at these hybrid constructions. I'm a real believer that, you know, we can... You know, people are a bit religious. You know, we've got to do everything in wood or everything in concrete. That's not the optimal way, necessarily. These hybrid constructions can really um, bring a lot. And, you know, here what we're now trying to do is work with individual countries because each regional situation is different. We have some funding to develop roadmaps to look at the entire construction chain Where's the potential for reduction? And I think this is the kind of approach that we need to, we need to build on for the future. So Thanks thank a lot, you. Karen. <laughs> Karen, I really liked your point on international um, collaboration and partnerships. That's something I hope we can come back to in the discussion later as well. Um, but for the, mo for the moment, I'd like to move on to Claire. Uh, Claire, as we've already heard, we know steel is going to be part of our, our landscape in the future as well, but of course it's, it's, it's high in emissions. We can't get around that for the time being. Um, could you explain what some of the main opportunities are to decarbonize steel at the moment, what the industry is doing, and, and what, is the, what is the prospect of achieving that quickly, given that the decisions that we're making now are going to impact the landscape that we have, of course, in 2030, but also in 2050? All right, thanks, Jen. And yes, so... Uh, Within the, on a global level, we're producing around 1.9 billion tons of steel. Um, but we actually produce more CO2 in terms of tonnage than we do for, for steel. It's around two tons of CO2 per ton of steel, which seems a little ridiculous. Um, but, but, that, but that's how it is on an average level. Uh, and, and more than 50% of the steel that we're making actually goes into the construction and infrastructure sector. So it's a really sort of uh, key driver for the industry to, to make these changes. Um, quickly, um, that's to be seen. I think it's, uh, it's, it's an old, um, well-established industry. We've already made you know, all, all, uh, many of the incremental improvements in energy efficiency and things so far, and what's really now needed to make these big changes are real breakthrough technologies. And unfortunately, many of them, most of them, are not yet commercially available. So while you hear about you know, smaller projects, um, you know, you've got H2 Green Steel, you've got fantastic projects you know, typically in, in Sweden, but they're not really being able to deliver this huge 1.9 billion tons of steel. Scrap, uh, recycling of scrap is one of the decarbonization levers that can be used today. Um, and together with low carbon um, electricity as a supply, that can really help make changes to the, to the emission profile. However, there is just not enough scrap available um, to be making all new steel out of recycled steel, particularly when we're looking at the 
uh, developments, um, and as we've heard earlier, you know, typically in India and, and other areas, th th there isn't going to be enough scrap available even by 2050. It's still projected that we'll need 50% of steel made from virgin materials by that time. So yes, we could try and get, you know, some companies try and increase their steel uh, scrap use, but that's just taking it away from other people who are currently using it. And we certainly don't want to be encouraging people to be recycling steel before it's reached the end of its life. It's more, you know, circular economy aspects of making the steel last longer. So while that's um, sort of a, a potential short-term solution, we also are needing a huge amount more of this low-carbon electricity. The steel industry is in, in the uh, integrated, so, so making steel from primary materials. Yes, it is very energy intensive, but when you're using the, the fossil materials, we're actually generating a lot of our own electricity that we then need further downstream. If we're changing the steel production processes, we won't be making our own electricity anymore. So we will have a higher demand again on these renewable energy sources. So what do we need? So hydrogen. Um, everybody wants some hydrogen. The steel industry wants a huge amount as well. Uh, this is not only as a, as a low-carbon energy source, but also as a reductant that can be used um, to remove the carbon from the, from the iron ore. So this is, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not just up to the steel industry to, to make changes to technologies. We actually need these additional parts as well. Uh, new types of making, uh, of turning the iron ore into usable iron, so direct reduced iron. Um, again, the, if this is done with uh, green or low carbon electricity, then this helps also, but it's, but it's another requirement we have there. And then um, competing also on a CCS basis, um, we know that the cement and concrete sector have a requirement for this um, storage capacity, uh, but so do we as a steel industry. So in terms of timing, many of the steel companies have their targets for 2050, which they're quite confident about but we need targets to be achieved a lot sooner. Um, and these are the ones which are a lot more challenging. So we can't do this alone. Um, we need the low carbon energy. We also need good government policy. Um, we need the demand from, from consumers, from customers, whether it's private consumers or from uh, public sources. And it's great we have all these different initiatives uh, that companies can sign up to. We have the Steel Zero, we have IDDI and First Movers Coalition and things. So that's all together with the government policy and also the finance. It's going to cost, we haven't calculated this ourselves, but you can search, it's, it's going to cost the industry between three and five trillion dollars to decarbonize. Um, that's obviously on a, on a global level, but it's really key that we work together um, and also working together with other materials. You don't make a building out of steel. Um, so it's about collaborating with other materials, the cement, concrete and other sectors to help achieve this. Thanks, Claire. Yeah, thanks for highlighting as well the need that to really that we can't do this in isolation and the connections to so many of the other competing resources um, that are required for other parts of the transition as well around hydrogen, renewables, etc. There's a holistic view that needs to be taken around balancing all of these different pieces. Um, so I'd like to move on to, to you, Eunice. Um, another heavy emitting sector, uh, cement and concrete. Um, we've heard from Karen and Chris already the importance of, of that material. It's the second most used substance in the world um, after water. And so could you tell us a little bit more about how, how the industry is collaborating um, within the industry, also with others, um, and, and what the ambitions are, what the tangible actions um, are that are being taken by the industry to, to, to transition and to decarbonize? Thank you so much, Fiona. Uh, let me just maybe talk right into this. Thanks so much, Fiona, and, and I think uh, Chris gave us a really good uh, primer for uh, the various levers that uh, we're taking in the concrete industry. Uh, but I'll, I'll walk us through a few elements here. Uh, I'm relatively new to the concrete industry. I come from the chemicals and material science industry. Uh, but you know, for concrete, as we all know, it really is a key enabler of the resilient and sustainable built environment. Uh, concrete combines durability, uh, resilience to climate related as well as natural disasters, its cost effectiveness as well as widespread availability. Uh, the industry has come together to agree on a global decarbonization roadmap and strategy. Uh, 40 of the world's leading cement and concrete pro producers representing 80% of the global production outside of China collectively announced 
their commitment to provide society with net zero concrete by 2050 and, and to play a positive role in sustainable development. And certainly, I think we all, well, we all agree that 2050 is a long way away and we need to do this uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, what we recognize, though, is that there is no silver bullet technology, right? There's going to be a range of various decarbonization levers that are required, and they're pretty common across the cement and concrete producers. The decarbonization levers are, uh, I'll, I'll simplify them a little bit different than what you saw from uh, Chris earlier, but they're, they're pretty, uh, pretty much the same. Uh, product formulation is one. Advanced production, fuel use, material efficiency, um, innovative technologies, and certainly how we uh, utilize the technology in terms of uh, downstream in the value chain. Now at COP28, um, GCCA was central in coordinating the launch of the Cement Breakthrough Agenda, and that is co-chaired um, uh, co -chaired by the Canadian as well as the UAE governments. Uh, the GCCA also has developed an EPD tool, and it's a web-based tool that is uh, providing throughout the supply chain EPD of aggregates, clinkers, cement, concrete, as well as precast elements as well. And it's, pre and it's uh, verified as well as complying with relevant standards. GCCA is a global sector association, has for many years hosted a global database as well, which is contained, uh, which contains consistent greenhouse gas data for industry, which provides a sound basis for the development of natural uh, decarbonization roadmap, uh, national decarbonization roadmaps. Um, now, the GCCA Net Zero Country Roadmap Accelerator Program is also helping national cement and concrete industries develop, um, I'm losing my, my, uh, my place here, but developing uh, their own roadmap. So each one of the companies also has their own roadmap, and the CRH, uh, we are a global uh, manufacturer of building materials. And so, you know, for, for CRH, we have a roadmap that leads us to 2030 as well as a net zero roadmap to 2050. And that roadmap is addressing uh, clinker substitution, fossil fuel reg reductions, and increased use of alternative fuels, increased efficiency in concrete production, as well as increased efficiency in the design of concrete products, projects. So we've talked a, a bit about earlier this morning, as well as uh, just now about, you know, really designing in uh, low concrete, uh, low carbon solutions and circular solutions, as well as addressing uh, nature and your designs as well. As, we are, as we're addressing getting to 2050, CCUS technology has to be a part of infrastructure development. And so for, for CRH, as a, we're a proud member of the GCCA, uh, we have over 76,000 employees and we operate in 29 countries. So we have, we're a very large operation and we're more than concrete, we're more than cement. We also have other infrastructure solutions that are addressing water and water storm management solutions as well. Uh, but as we are addressing decarbonization, it's a collaboration. It's a collaboration up and down the value chain um, and pretty far down the value chain uh, in order for us to uh, bring these low carbon solutions to the market. Thanks a lot, Eunice. A round of applause for all of those people. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's really encouraging to see how the, the sector is coming together um, to, to put forward solutions, but also has an ambitious vision for, um, for reaching its decarbonization target. Um, now over to you, Pascal. Um, my personal perception, and that may just be the, the bubble that I sit within, is that steel and cement receive a lot of attention from the international community in terms of um, the need to decarbonize. But of course, um, there are other building materials as well that can contribute significantly to decarbonization and, 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 and supporting the transition if, uh, if we reduce the embodied carbon in those materials as well. Um, now, so I'd like to understand a little bit more from you if you could educate us um, as to what it is that the glass and insulation industry is doing uh, to decarbonize and, and what some of the main opportunities are. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, actually, uh, flat glass and insulation are small, smaller emitters in terms of greenhouse gas than uh, concrete and steel. Still, uh, we are a big emitter, so we need to, to improve. Uh, before I start, so I will not uh, talk for all insulation materials. Uh, it's a very large... Uh, a world of diverse materials. So I will focus only on mineral wool insulation products, 
they have very sim uh, lots of similarities with uh, the production of flat glass, and it makes sense to to talk of both together. So before I start talking about decarbonization, I would like to remind that flat glass in buildings and mineral wood insulation are key enablers for the decarbonization of the, of the building sector. Uh, they contribute to significantly reduce the operational carbon emissions by reducing the need for uh, energy, uh, for heating, cooling, and lighting. And as such, uh, they, they, they play a, a major role. And uh, when we look at the balance between energy uh, used during production, transportation, and end of life, and the related emissions, and compare to what will be saved over the entire life cycle of the building or during the lifetime of the product, the balance is uh, by far positive. So in average, or at least it's, uh, 100, uh, it's 100 times uh, savings compared to uh, consumptions. Um, another uh, preliminary remark, uh, it's not just about carbon, uh, gl flat glass and insulation contributes also to health and, and well-being in buildings by delivering more comfortable indoor environments. Thus being said, uh, the production of flat glass and uh, mineral wool insulation products are high temperature, energy intensive processes. Most of the greenhouse gas emissions uh, associated with those products are mainly coming uh, at two stages. First, uh, for the extraction and processing of the raw materials, and more importantly, uh, during uh, the manufacturing stage, that includes in particular uh, the melting of uh, the, uh, the mineral raw materials in high temperature furnaces. And the, uh, the temperature of melting is uh, above 1,600 degrees. Um, so far, unlike for cement, there is no global roadmap to decarbonize those industries. Uh, most of the big players have committed to be net zero uh, carbon by 2050. Uh, in Europe, the trade associations, Glass for Europe for flat glass, uh, Eurima for Mineral Wool Association, have published last year uh, roadmaps to explain how they, they can decarbonize and uh, fulfill this uh, zero carbon commitment by 2050. Uh, and uh, we can say that already today, both industries, flat glass and mineral wool industry, have already taken significant stake to, uh, uh, to decrease their carbon emissions. Uh, just to give an example, between 1990 and today, both industries uh, in Europe, uh, I don't have figures uh, for globally, but for Europe, they have decreased uh, their uh, emissions by 40% already. And uh, this is mainly due to uh, the supporting uh, policies in Europe with uh, the emis emission trading uh, scheme, uh, the Renewable Directive, and uh, the Energy Efficiency Directive. There are three main levers to, to, to decarbonize uh, those industries, uh, four, four main levers. The first one is to uh, make our products lighter. If you make uh, lighter glass, uh, lighter insulation products, you will uh, reduce uh, not only the use of materials, but also the, uh, the, the emissions. Second, uh, we are improving the energy efficiency uh, in our processes. We replace, we upgrade our furnaces, we improve their insulation, and uh, we install uh, waste heat recovery systems. The third, uh, and this is probably uh, one of the main um, lever, is to switch to low carbon raw materials, and in particular, to use more recycled content in those products. Uh, today, uh, for uh, glass mineral wool insulation, uh, we use in average 60% recycled content in Europe. It can go up to 80% in Europe. In Japan, we go even up to 95% recycled content in, in glass wool. For flat glass, it's uh, in average 26% recycled content in Europe. And uh, just to give an, ex an example of the impact of uh, uh, using recycled glass instead of virgin raw materials. For every ton of recycled glass we use, we save 700 kilograms of CO2. Um, so it's not just theory. We have launched last year, uh, in 2022, uh, a, fl a new flat glass product with a reduced carbon footprint of 40%, thanks to using uh, high recycled content of 64%. The fourth and last uh, lever is to switch uh, to uh, decarbonized fuel. Uh, it's, a, it's about electrifying our uh, melting process, developing hybrid or fuel-flexible furnaces, and transitioning to biogas 
and green hydrogen. Uh, we were able in 2022 to demonstrate that it is possible to have a zero carbon production of flat glass, so scope one and two at zero. We, we made uh, a production using 100% recycled glass and 100% uh, renewable energy. Um, we, we have already tested uh, the use of hydrogen and we made uh, production with 30% hydrogen uh, in R&D trials in Germany. And uh, we mentioned collaboration. We are uh, collaborating with one of our main competitors, uh, AGC, not to name it, uh, on the design of a new furnace, hybrid furnace, to, to using uh, oxygen and uh, electricity and, and gas. For the next decade, uh, we will probably uh, mainly uh, rely on energy efficiency and circularity. Uh, the, the, the switch to uh, less uh, carbonated energy will be mainly uh, influenced by uh, the availability of this energy. In the long term, we will, for the remaining uh, emissions, consider CCUS, like uh, steel and concrete, but we, we take it only as uh, an ultimate uh, option once we will have made all efforts to decrease our emissions. Um, just to conclude, uh, what do we need to, to move ahead? First, uh, we need to have access to uh, good quality recycled content. Uh, like for steel, uh, there is a, we, sta we start to fight for recycled glass. So we need to get as much uh, recycled glass as possible. Uh, there, there are lots of sources, just to, to mention in France, 90% of the windows are still ending in landfill. So there is potential for improvement. Mm -hmm. Uh, so there we need uh, policies to facilitate the development of more circular business models. Um, we need also to have uh, access to uh, affordable and uh, uh, available uh, alternative fuels. So clearly low carbon electricity, hydrogen or biomethane uh, are uh, energies we, we are very much willing to use. We are just struggling to, to get access to it. So uh, there are policies to support development of decarbonized energy and affordable energy is, uh, is key. Third, we need also to have demand for low carbon products. Uh, it's not a given, so it's not just because you can offer a low carbon product that you have the demand from uh, contractors or specifiers. So there is uh, clearly a need to have also policies that will consider uh, all life carbon uh, requirements and put results. Clearly, uh, we, we see it in France we see it in Denmark, where regulations have started to put results on uh, all life carbon. Uh, it drives the market uh, demand towards low carbon products. And last but not least, uh, there is still a lot to do in terms of research and development. So anything in terms of policy that can facilitate, uh, nurture, uh, collaborative R&D uh, across our industries, but also across industries, will be more than welcome. Thank you so much, Pascal. I mean, some of the, the, the things that I learned from, from your intervention just there is, is really around, um, A, the competition between some of the sectors as well, right? There, there are sort of limited resources out there, and, and there is going to be a bit of a discussion around um, how things like, like renewables, like grid infrastructure, like uh, CCUS capabilities are going to be allocated amongst um, the different sectors. Um, there is a need for demand for the um, decarbonized products as well, right? These two, this is the other side of the equation is that we've spoken about supply now and you've given me a perfect transition to the second panel, which is all around demand. So I'd like to thank you all again for your contributions. A round of applause for all of our panelists. And I'll continue by calling up our second panel. So first up we have Jessica Skilbeck, who is the Director for Net Zero Buildings Portfolio and Aff Affordability at the UK uh, Department for Energy Security and Net Zero. Uh, we have Andrew Forth, who is the Senior Lead for Steel Zero Public Affairs and Policy at the Climate Group. And we have Rob Van Riet, who is the Head of the First Movers Coalition, which is hosted by the World Economic Forum. Thank you so much for joining us for the second panel. Um, we already heard about uh, the role that consumers can potentially play as well in terms of creating demand 
for decarbonized building materials. Um, really, we have multiple parts of this equation. We have the public sector and we have the private sector that we're going to be talking about today. Um, I'd like to start with the public sector. So the Industrial Deep Decarbonization Initiative is actually a coalition of 10 governments uh, that are working to drive additional action on the deep decarbonization of industries with a focus on steel, cement, and concrete. Um, I'd like to start with you, Jess. We know governments can play a role in driving the demand and creating an enabling environment for the decarbonization of building materials. They can signal demand. They can also set the overall direction for policy and give sort of a guiding vision to, to industry in terms of creating clarity in the market. Um, so how is the UK government approaching demand signaling, approaching this topic? Um, and, and we know that you're the co-lead of the Industrial Deep Decarbonization Initiative as well. So we'd love to hear a little bit more about how you're engaging with the initiative. Well, thank you very much. I'm really pleased to be here today. I've learned so much already. It's been absolutely fascinating listening to the discussion. Um, well, decarbonising industry is a global challenge, and the UK is proud to be a key player in a coalition of countries leading the way for the rest of the world, seeking a joint approach on creating demand for low-carbon products. We know that we, both governments and businesses, must act now to reduce emissions and transform our outlook if we're to stay on track to achieve net zero. Through stronger international col collaboration with others, we can develop new technologies faster, increase production of low carbon products, and bring down the overall costs of industrial decarbonization. <coughs> we're really proud to be working with the IDDI and the First Movers Coalition to unite countries and companies to support our shared commitments in both public and private procurement. The Breakthrough Agenda is a key mechanism for increasing collaboration. This international framework, which the UK launched alongside world leaders back at COP26, is supported by countries representing 80% of global GDP. It now covers seven sectors, each of global importance for reaching our climate goals, covering 60% of emissions. Three of these sectors are of particular importance for decarbonising materials for buildings and construction. Firstly, the steel breakthrough, which the UK co-leads alongside Germany. At COP28, we also welcome the launch of the new cement breakthrough, led by Canada and the UAE, and of course the buildings breakthrough, led by France and Morocco. We're proud to be supporting these new breakthroughs and to endorse the Buildings Breakthrough Priority Actions, which will be launched tomorrow. These breakthroughs are enabling countries and initiatives such as IDDI and the First Movers Coalition to maximise impact and align action around the critical enablers for decarbonising the sector, including demand creation. At COP28, the UK announced its commitment to the IDDI Green Public Procurement Pledge demonstrating progress against the steel breakthrough priority actions. We were also joined by other members of the IDDI, Germany, Canada and the United States in committing to the pledge. In the UK's announcement, we confirmed our intention to meet level three of the pledge. This means that we will adopt time-bound commitments that require the disclosure of embodied carbon, whole life cycle assessments and the procurement of low emission steel, cement and concrete for public construction projects. These commitments will help achieve net zero emissions in public buildings and the built infrastructure. We're already working to fulfil levels one and two of the pledge with procurement policies that set expectations for emission reporting requirements and implementing whole life cycle assessments across government estates and infrastructure. In addition, we're enabling the future production of near-zero emission steel and cement by leveraging public and private investment, including the £1 billion net zero innovation portfolio and the £210 million industrial decarbonisation challenge. The pledge marks a pivotal step in driving progress to decarbonise industrial materials, and we hope that many more countries will join the fold. The UK is proud to lead the way in industrial decarbonisation through leadership of IDDI as well as through the Breakthrough Agenda. We continue to strive for collaboration with other countries to boost global demand for lower, lower emission steel, cement and concrete and work towards achieving net zero together. Thank you.
Thanks a lot, Jessica. And let me take this opportunity as well to commend the leadership of the UK within the IDDI, but also uh, within the, the Breakthrough Agenda. We found it to be an immensely valuable um, coordinating mechanism across the many initiatives um, and organizations that are working in this space. It's also helped us to um, solidify our, our connections with, with some of the other colleagues from the Climate Group and the First Movers Coalition uh, that are here with us today. So um, moving on, after we've heard from the, how the, the public sector is, is really driving that vision. I'd like to move to uh, the climate group, which has um, commitments under a steel zero and a concrete zero campaign, um, which include, as I understand it, an interim commitment for low emissions uh, industrial products by 2030, and then uh, near zero emissions materials by 2050. Uh, so, Andrew, if you could tell us a little bit more about how private sector commitments can complement what the what the public sector is doing, um, and 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 how the private sector is looking about s sourcing uh, that decarbonized <laughs> material as well. Yeah, um, thanks, Fiona. Thanks everyone for coming to listen to what I think is the most exciting session of the day. Um, <laughs> I think the crucial question that we need to answer is how do we get the collaboration between the public sector, the product manufacturers, the product users, the investors, and civil society. So it's great that you're all in the room today. Um, with the Steel Zero and Concrete Zero campaigns, our aim is really simple. We want to decarbonize the global steel and concrete industries by 2050 at the very latest. Um, on my way here today, I walked past the Louis Vuitton Foundation building in the Bois de Boulogne, which is a it's a thing. Um, <laughs> the thing that struck me is it looks like an arc. And if we don't succeed in this challenge, we're going to need a very big arc, is the reality. This is a, a scary situation. So what do we do at Climate Group? Well, our initiatives try to create that demand-side voice, saying to the product manufacturers, we want to buy green industrial products. What does that mean in reality? Well, the four things that we do with our members and that we are looking to work with the public sector and the private sector. One is data. The information out there at the moment on how much carbon is emitted by specific building products is not good enough. Um, we know data on many things. We don't have ac access to accurate data on how much concrete and steel is being used in a project and what the emissions intensity is. We've just completed the first round of reporting with our members and the results are quite scary. Even companies who want to buy greener steel, concrete and steel struggle to get that information from their suppliers. That's not good enough. We need to move fast on that. The second one, as has been discussed, is how do we work with governments and with the private sector to create the standards that both enable, and this is particularly an issue in concrete where building regulations do not move fast enough to keep up with the innovations, um, if you go out into the hall there, you'll see pretty much every material I've ever heard of being used in construction, they're uh, suggesting using it in concrete. The regulatory structures aren't ready for that yet. How do we build on things like the, what the French government have done and what the Scottish government have done in setting limits on the embodied carbon per square metre of construction? It's a really good start. How do we drive that faster? <coughs> and secondly, how do we make people feel secure in this decarbonisation journey. We work with our members and with the suppliers in these sectors to share knowledge about how things are going, to work together to identify and solve the problems which they're facing in terms of discussions with regulators, discussions with clients, discussions with the public. And how do we take innovation from the laboratory and from the kind of small scale into the larger scale? I think the final thing that we think is really important about these in it initiatives like Steel Zero and Concrete Zero and the First Movers Coalition, is it sending a market signal to people that, particularly in developed markets, business as usual isn't going to wash in the future. Um, someone asked me today to bet when the last blast furnace will close in Europe. If you're, a steel, if you're using steel in Europe and you rely on blast furnace steel, I would say you've not got as long as you think before you're going to have to suggest it. Someone said 2035. I think that's going to be ambitious if it's going to be operating in 2035. So if you think your business is sustainable today and you're not committing to building products that are greener, how sustainable is your business, really? Um, I'll leave it at that. Um, come and speak to us. We're very nice. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, with a carrot, you don't want to see the stick, would be my message I want you to take away. Thanks, Andrew, for uh, those messages. Also, that thinly veiled threat. <laughs> um, I'm a good cop. Um, I can only I can only support what you said, though, uh, particularly around the need for accurate and transparent data frameworks, um, clear standards as well, um, and 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 just harmonized methodologies to measure the GHG emissions that we're using to actually demonstrate that these are green or decarbonized materials. Yep. Without that, um, we, will, we, we won't get there. Um, so moving on to you, Rob, the First Movers Coalition commitments, on the other hand, um, have slightly earlier or more ambitious um, uh, deadlines, I would say. Uh, you're asking the private sector to commit to the procurement of near zero emissions products by 2030 already. So very ambitious and just around the corner. Um, how can these advanced purchase commitments really help to stimulate experimentation, the innovation that's needed to get us to some of those breakthrough technologies that will support us along the transition? Yeah, thanks, um, thanks Fiona. And um, just to echo what, what Jess said, it's been very um, steep learning curve for me today as well. I've learned a lot from the presentation, so a big thank you to everybody who has uh, spoken before. I'm very happy um, to be here, and I mean that in the most practical sense of the word, <laughs> because I took a wrong turn when I entered the building, <laughs> and I found myself in a wing of this building by myself uh, in a darkened hallway, but I made it, and, um, uh, but, I pa I, but I panicked there for a second. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think the point was already made earlier that um, by 2050, about half of the re reductions uh, that we need to see for net zero emissions are coming from technologies uh, that are not yet at at scale, uh, let alone at uh, commercial scale. This is also a point that Claire made. Um, clearly, innov innovation and experimentation is thus needed, and that is no different in the um, sectors for the building materials, steel, cement and concrete, but also aluminum, which the First Movers Coalition also covers. Uh, that's why the First Movers Coalition was set up uh, two years ago, to effectively leverage the purchasing power of big companies to create that early market demand for these breakthrough uh, clean technologies for which there currently is no real market. So what does that very concretely mean? Companies make uh, cross sectors and they're free to make commitments in multiple sectors if they feel so ambitious. Uh, they commit to purchase a specific percentage by 2030 of their volume at near zero emission product and technologies. Now I won't go into the in-scope technologies in each of the sectors. Happy to talk about that, by the way. Come and find me as well afterwards. It's not a competition, <laughs> but come, come and find us both uh, to talk through what are those technologies in scope. Suffice it to say, the commitment when I look at steel, cement and concrete, and aluminum is to by 2030 have 10% at least of your volume be near zero emission steel, cement and concrete, or aluminum. So we now have uh, 98 members. I think number 98 joined two days ago. Very happy about that. Um, 98 companies that have made more than 120 commitments across those sectors. If I look at uh, steel, cement and concrete, and aluminum, it's 52 companies that have made commitments. And we crunched the numbers uh, a few months ago in the run-up to Dubai, the run-up to COP. It's, uh, it's, send it's sending the biggest private sector demand signal for these deep decarbonization technologies. Almost four billion in annual demand by 2030. Um, that's great. Uh, I will say, though, that um, this demand signal needs to hit what I sort of on the train over this morning realized are the four C's. So um, if the demand signal is credible, and we go to great lengths to make sure that it is. You know, we, 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 we accept companies when they're serious about, uh, about the commitment they're making. If the demand signal is credible, it gives confidence and clarity and thus can be catalytic. So those are the four C's that came to me on the Eurostar this morning. Um, but a demand signal alone, and this has also been alluded to earlier, of course doesn't create a market. Uh, there are a number of other things that have to occur on the supply side. We need to bring in financiers. Government policy has been mentioned a few times. Uh, if I think about what FMC is doing, I would say it's both the signal that is important, because it's the signal that is sending uh, hopefully confidence to suppliers, but the offtake that follows the signal is equally important. So let me just, three brief uh, reflections on that front. 
The first would be that it's innovation in terms of what everybody understands to be innovation, so R&D, you know, first of kind projects, all of that good stuff. But it's also what Eunice referred to in the, in the previous panel. It's innovation in how you collaborate with each other. Some of the most exciting things I've seen in the First Movers Coalition is our members collaborating across the value chain, because they sit in each other's value chain often, to absorb uh, the risk, share the green premium. So you have companies that together, you know, an iron ore producer, a steel company, and an energy, producing, an energy producer making low carbon or near zero emission steel. It's another company that buys the steel to make trucks. It's another company that buys the trucks because they made a trucking commitment. And I find that a, to be quite a beautiful and inspiring sort of example of value chain collaboration. We also see collaborative procurement. I, I see somebody with a, with a paper up, so I'm not going to go into that. I'm going to wrap <laughs> up. Um, second, just briefly, is uh, the importance of offtake. You know, uh, mm -hmm. Offtake is what project producers need to crowd in and to get traditional project financing. We can point now to more than 100 examples of offtake that our members have taken. We need to scale that up rapidly. And the third is, and I was sort of, uh, I w I'm including this because I was w walking the um, outside in, in the, the hall there and seeing lot, lots of suppliers, lots of uh, startups, break up, uh, breakthrough technologies. Um, we at the First Movers Coalition are now also trying to surface supply in a much more intentional way and connect that supply with our offtakers. So we launched a couple of months ago something known as the First Suppliers Hub, where suppliers can provide their data on the projects they're running at different TRL levels and indicate what timeline they're running against. So this gives visibility to our off-takers because we keep hearing where is the supply coming, where is the supply emerging, uh, so that they can then you know, make the deals going forward. Um, I'll leave it there in the interest of time, but thanks again. Thanks a lot, Rob. First of all, we are also very happy you made it today. <laughs> and uh, I, I really like the point you made about broadening the scope of what we interpret as innovation. Uh, this goes beyond innovation in technology. We also need innovation in collaboration. We need innovation in procurement as well, uh, in the systems that we use uh, more generally. And, and we need to take creative approaches to, to this transition. Uh, and, and, and second of all, uh, the need for a credible commitment. Commitments are one thing, but we also need to underscore it with specific actions and, and a vision and, and, and milestones along the way before 2030 and 2050 in order to, for, for, to give that confidence to investors um, that, that they should be inv investing in these decarbonization technologies. Um, now, we are almost at time, so I don't have any follow-up questions. I, I do have follow-up questions, but I don't have time to ask you the follow-up questions, unfortunately. Um, so I'd like everyone to give a big round of applause to our speakers today. And feel free to stay seated. We have one more speaker today who will be closing out our session, um, Dr. Dean Haslip, who is the Director General of the Office of Energy Efficiency at Natural Resources, Resources Canada. I'd um, like to invite you up to the podium to give a closing statement. Thank you so much. Everybody can hear me in the back? Excellent. Uh, so, Yes, good afternoon. Uh, I am Dean Haslip. I'm the Director General of the Office of Energy Efficiency at Natural Resources Canada. And on behalf of the Government of Canada, I'm pleased to be here at the first Buildings and Climate Global Forum to, uh, to present to you at this session on decarbonizing building materials. Today, we heard a range of insights on the use of low-carbon materials uh, to improve carbon performance in buildings and how technical uh, innovations are going to be providing solutions for the future. Uh, we also heard how public and private initiatives alike are driving both the supply and the demand for low carbon products and buildings. And recognizing the benefits of the circular economy and the life cycle approaches today is necessary for our global shift to sustainable materials. We, we heard about the uh, about the, the necessity for streamlining the disse dissemination of new technologies and how governments can play a key role in creating an enabling environment for those. We heard about steel, we heard about a number of promising technologies, but that th there's so much more progress that is needed. Uh, we heard about, in, in that same context, the demand for low-carbon electricity and low-carbon hydrogen to, to fuel all of that. 
Uh, on the cement side, we heard very promising words about the, the global uh, roadmap to get to net zero by 2050 through a combination of things like alternative fuels and clinker substitutions and clinker reductions and CCUS. On the glass and insulation side, we heard about uh, their commitment to go zero carbon by 2050. Um, and the really, really encouraging news about the decrease in emissions of 40% in Europe alone. And you know, through a combination of using uh, lighter materials, uh, energy efficiency in processes, um, greater energy efficiency in processes, of course, and about the use of lower carbon raw materials. Uh, our panelists here highlighted the importance of engaging with buyers and producers of building materials to reduce carbon emissions. Uh, we heard about initiatives that are creating stronger demand for low carbon building materials, and many of the organizations that we represent, including at home in Canada in my case, are part of these critical initiatives. Uh, that helped to send a strong market signal, as was mentioned a few minutes ago, and accelerate the deployment of innovative solutions. We heard about the necessity for good data on both the quantity of materials and the carbon intensity of those materials, the regulatory environment in helping us to adapt and adopt new materials, and uh, even advanced purchase commitments and other initiatives that can be used to, to strengthen that demand for those materials. Now, of course, the task at hand is significant. Uh, governments and private industry cannot act alone. The window for action is narrowing. As it was just said a few minutes ago, innovation and experimentation is absolutely needed. So international collaboration, such as we're seeing here at this forum, is essential to offer a shared direction towards the built environment that we all want to see. And as we like to say in Canada, we all need to be rowing in the same direction. Tomorrow, along with other national governments, Canada will proudly endorse the Déclaration de Chaillou, a ministerial declaration that sets a framework for cooperation to transform the building sector. And we both welcome and encourage this commitment from other governments. The Breakthrough Agenda, which has also been mentioned uh, at this session and which was launched at, uh, at COP, is another important international commitment or set of international commitments to accelerate the deployment of clean technologies. Canada and many other countries have signed on to the Buildings Breakthrough, which is co-led by France and the Kingdom of Morocco, with a collective commitment to make near zero emission and resilient buildings the new normal by 2030. Uh, Canada is also excited to co-chair the Cement and Concrete Breakthrough with the UAE. The initiative aims to ensure that near zero emission cement is the preferred choice in global markets, with efficient use in near zero emission cement production established and growing in every region of the world by 2030. And we heard about the cement breakthrough here and, and about the, the initiatives to encourage the development of EPDs and to support um, uh, national programs. We see action on the steel side as well. We heard about the steel breakthrough this morning, aiming to make near zero emission steel the preferred choice in global markets and growing in every region by 2030. These collaborations uh, are critical. We invite others to join. Those interested in learning more are encouraged to connect with the Breakthrough Agenda Secretariat and not to compete with the, the other <laughs> folks you're supposed to meet after this session. Your presence here today reaffirms the value of uh, leveraging international collaboration to tackle carbon emissions. Improving alignment, coordination, and prioritizing action across the value chain will help us to accelerate the transition to near zero emissions and resilient buildings. We invite you to take advantage of today's other thematic sessions on urban and skills, energy, finance, methods in construction and materials. Thank you for your time. Please enjoy the rest of your day. Well, I don't think I could have said anything else to conclude this <laughs> session. That was a perfect summary. Um, I'd like to invite you all to connect after the session to follow up with, with the many pieces uh, that were raised today. And thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining.